Hello, Computer Science and Math 447 students. In this sequence of videos, we're going to take a look at what are called the binomial coefficients. You'll see that these binomial coefficients are actually something you're already familiar with, maybe under a different name, but hopefully these videos will help convince you that there's a surprising amount of patterns and, and uses to these numbers. Among those many uses, we'll see how the uh, binomial coefficients or suitable related concepts can help us in answering questions like these two. If you like, go ahead and pause the video now and try to answer these. All right. Well, the plan for us will be this. In the first video, we're going to discuss how binomial coefficients relate to something you've seen before. We're going to see how this all connects to Pascal's triangle, a neat geometric structure with lots of interesting properties. In the second video, we'll see where binomial coefficients get their name. We'll discuss three famous uh, celebrity theorems. Uh, the binomial theorem, the multinomial theorem, Newton's binomial theorem, and uh, these uh, will help. Uh, we'll see how the binomial coefficients help in expanding powers of binomials. We'll also see that the binomial coefficients are good for a lot more as well. Finally, in the third video, we'll discuss some further identities that the binomial coefficients uh, satisfy, and we'll see how these identities can be proved in non-algebraic ways, but instead uh, proved by some clever counting. So it should be fun. Well, to kick things off in this first video, the first part of our discussion, let's review the walker problem from the first screen. Uh, you'll remember from that screen, the walker needs to get from this lower left-hand corner of the grid to the upper right-hand corner by walking along grid lines and always moving closer to the goal, always moving either to the right or up, never moving to the left or, or down. And the question is, how many different ways are there to do this, to get from this uh, lower left corner to the upper right hand corner. Well we saw a homework problem similar to this one a couple weeks ago and so you may have already come up with an answer of uh, 9 choose 4 which is 126. One way to solve this problem is to note that no matter which route the uh, walker takes he will need to take a total of four blocks in an upward direction and five blocks to the right for a total of nine blocks walked Though, of course, we can mix up the timing on when the walker walks up and to the right. For instance, the walker could go three blocks to the right, two blocks up, the remaining two blocks to the right, followed by the, a final two blocks upward. On the other hand, the, uh, the walker could just start with one block up, then all five blocks to the right, and finishing with the, uh, the remaining three upward blocks. So we have a different route for each ordering of four upward steps and, uh, and five steps to the, to the right. And so if we can count the number of orderings like that, we'll have our number of routes. Well, that answer can be found by imagining the nine steps that will be in the journey. We know that of those nine steps, four of them will be upwards, while the rest will automatically be rightwards. So the number of routes possible is the number of different ways to choose four steps from a sequence of nine steps. And that answer is 9 choose 4, which is the 126 we mentioned before. Now incidentally, we've been calling these numbers choose numbers so far in class. But these, uh, these numbers that we're already familiar with are what we'll now co call binomial coefficients, for reasons that will be clearer in the next video. These uh, binomial coefficients are the subject of these three videos. Returning now to the Walker problem, let's imagine that we want to uh, count the routes not as 9 choose 4, but instead we want to answer this problem in a different way, maybe uh, in stages. So let's suppose we want to keep track not just of how many ways there are to get to the very end of the, uh, the grid, but we'd like to keep track of how many ways there are to get from the left -hand, lower left-hand corner to anywhere in the grid. So I'm going to fill out the grid with these numbers starting in the bottom left. The question is how many ways there are to get from the lower left-hand corner to the lower left-hand corner? Well, there's only one way to do that. You simply stay put where you are. Now, moving on to the uh, next uh, positions, though, how many ways are there to get from the lower left-hand corner to this spot, which is on the bottom edge? Well, you can see there's only one route. The only way to get from the bottom left to here is to travel along this bottom edge. There's no other way. Similarly, uh, to get to the, uh, uh, the number the, the intersection directly above the bottom left, there's only one way to, to walk there as well. Now continuing on, 
you probably won't be surprised to see that, yeah, for any spot along this uh, bottom edge or along this left edge, there will only be one way to get there from the lower left-hand corner. You simply walk along the, uh, the bottom edge, or if you're on the left edge, you simply walk up the left edge. Now for the uh, positions inside the grid, there's an interesting way to count the routes. So let's take a look at this intersection right here. Note that if you have a route that's going to go from the lower left-hand corner to this spot, you're going to have to come into this spot either along this horizontal edge or along this vertical edge. Those are the only two directions you could have come from as you're finishing your, your route. So how many routes are there that can get here? Well, I will have one route for every route from the lower left-hand corner up to this intersection just to the left because I could just take a route like that and then add a step to the right and it gives me a route to this intersection. Similarly, if I wanted to, I could also just take any route from the lower left to this spot just below the intersection and tack on a step upwards afterwards. So the number of ways to get to this intersection is just the number of routes here plus the number of routes here. And that's why we get two routes. Uh, one route here, one route here, and those add together to give us the two routes that uh, there are between the, uh, the lower left and this intersection. Now, as I uh, continue on through the later intersections in the grid, you'll see that the pattern continues. We have ones along the lower left and along the, uh, the or sorry, the lower uh, edge of the grid and along the left edge of the grid. And then for these interior intersections, um, it's always the number of paths to the spot just to the left plus the number of paths to the spot just below it. For instance, to get here, it's pretty easy to see that there are exactly three paths you could take from the lower left up to that spot. There are, there's just one path that will go, come through this intersection before heading into that intersection. There are two paths that will head into this intersection before coming up here. We have the one that comes up and then over and then up again. And then we have the one that comes to the right and then comes up and then goes up again. So one plus two is three. That gives us our, uh, our number of routes into the intersection we care about. And uh, if we continue along the way, uh, filling out the later intersections with the number of routes there are from the lower left to those spots, we'll see that eventually we get 126 for our, our final answer. There are 126 routes from the lower left up to the top right that agrees with what we found before. And that's because we found earlier that there were 70 routes from the lower left up to this intersection. And those routes we can turn into routes into the final corner by just taking a step to the right. And there were 56 routes that could get you from the lower left to this intersection. And of course, each of those routes can be lengthened by one step upwards to give you another route up to the top corner. All right, now you may feel that in answering the problem, nine choose four is a much slicker way to find the answer, and I'd have to agree. But this way of looking at the problem teaches us something about these choose numbers, or these binomial coefficients. If you think about it, each of these numbers in the grid is a number of routes in the grid. And we can remember that to count the number of routes, we can always do it the way we originally did it. We can always think of a number of routes as a, a choose problem, as, an, as a problem whose answer is a binomial coefficient. And so what that means is that each of these numbers inside the grid is a binomial coefficient. And uh, how did we get the numbers in the grid? Well, we got each one of the ones in the middle by taking the sum of two numbers neighboring it. So each Binomial coefficient can be expressed as a sum of two earlier binomial coefficients. That will be an important idea a little bit later on. Now, also looking at the grid, you'll see some uh, patterns running along downward diagonals. So for instance, you may have noticed already we have a 1, a 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. And that may have rung a bell. If you do recognize those patterns, it will probably be from uh, Pascal's triangle, which is shown in part here. Okay, so this triangle starts with a one at the very top center, and we have ones continuing along both the left and the right-hand sides. 
and then each row contains one more number than the previous row did. And then inside each row, a number is exactly equal to the sum of the two numbers in the row immediately above it, the two numbers that are located in uh, a northwest or a northeast direction. Okay, so for instance, three is the sum of one plus two. As we come down here, 252 is the sum of 126 and 126 coming from the row above it. If we wanted to write down the next row, Pascal's triangle does go on forever, to find the number that goes in this spot, I know that I would need to take the two numbers to the upper left and upper right of it. I would take 210 and 252, add those together to get 462, and 462 is the number that would appear in this position in the next row. All right, now you'll note that uh, these numbers were found the same way that the grid numbers were found. In particular, you'll recognize this 126 and the 70 and the 56. If you were to go back in the video and take a look at the grid, you'll see that the numbers sort of in this region match the numbers in our grid. That means that Pascal's triangle uh, captures the choose numbers, the binomial coefficients. Now let's think about that in a bit more detail we can uh, take the binomial coefficients and identify them with certain locations in the triangle. In particular, remember that we said that 9 choose 4 was 126. Now thinking of the 9 as our n and the r as the 4, what we'll see is that n choose r is located on the nth row along the rth diagonal. Now I need to explain a little bit how the rows and diagonals are set up. So the rows are exactly what they sound like. Um, we're going to have this as the top row, the second row uh, down is that one, and so on. But these rows are numbered according to, uh, well they're, they're numbered beginning with the zeroth row. So I'm going to call this the zeroth row. The one below that will be row one, one after that is row two, row three, and so on. Now you'll notice that each row, so row four for instance, has the number four immediately after the first one. Okay, so that is a nice way to tell what row you're on. You simply take a look at the number that follows the, the beginning one. Now the diagonals are measured in a uh, northeast to southwest direction. So I'm gonna be looking along diagonals that slant downward and to the left like this. And I'm gonna call these diagonals um, diagonal zero diagonal 1, and so on. Now n choose r should be in the nth row and rth diagonal. So 126 was n choose r. That was supposed to be 9 choose 4. And you'll notice that this 126 is located in row 9, and it is located along diagonal 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, diagonal 4. All right, now this can be very handy if you want to find other uh, binomial coefficients and you don't necessarily remember the factorial formula for these binomial coefficients, you could quickly draw out Pascal's triangle if you wanted to. If I wanted to find uh, 10 choose 3, for instance, I could come down to row 10. I could go over to the third diagonal. So here's the zero, here's the first, here's the second diagonal, and here's the third. And 10 choose 3, I can see, is going to be 120. All right. Now, as you look at uh, Pascal's triangle, um, you'll see a lot of patterns. This is why these, uh, Pascal's triangle fascinates so many people. It's because of all the different patterns you can notice if you just look at it in different ways. Now this will translate into identities for our binomial coefficients, our, our choose numbers. Now here are the identities we've already seen so far in class. This first one in the middle, the one in blue, was what we called Pascal's formula. We said that n choose r was equal to n minus 1 choose r minus 1 plus n minus 1 choose r. Now if we think of this in terms of the table, if Pascal's triangle, we'll see that n choose r, just some generic location in the triangle, should be the sum of n minus 1 choose r minus 1. Now n minus 1 is uh, one row above the nth row, and r minus 1 means on the, r, on the diagonal right before the uh, location we started on. So n minus 1, choose r minus 1, is exactly the entry located to the uh, northwest of our entry. 
n minus 1 choose r is again on that row right before ours, but on the same diagonal. So we're actually talking about the entry that is northeast of the n choose r entry. And just like uh, the formula says, these numbers are obtained by adding the two numbers northwest and northeast together. So the reason why Pascal's triangle contains these binomial coefficients is because it is built in the same way. Binomial coefficients can be found adding earlier ones together in this way. Pascal's triangle is also built in that same way, and that's why the two agree so well. Now on the uh, left, you'll see one of our earlier identities, n choose r equals n choose n minus r. What that means in terms of the triangle is just that the triangle is symmetric about the center, an entry over here, for instance, 8 choose 2, is going to be the same as an entry over here, 8 choose 6. And uh, this just captures sort of the symmetry of the, the triangle. Now, if you take a look at this identity here, you'll see that what we're doing is adding together all of the uh, binomial coefficients, n choose k. We're leaving n alone. That will be the same. But we're letting k run from 0 to n. So what this means is in the triangle, we're adding all the numbers on the nth row where the diagonal we're dealing with runs from the zeroth diagonal all the way to the nth diagonal. In other words, we're adding all of the numbers on a single row, and the formula tells us that that should be a power of 2. And as you look at the rows of Pascal's triangle and you add them straight across, you'll see that that's always the case. Uh, if I add the top row, it's just 1. The row below that added together gives us 2 and then 4, and then 8, and then 16, we get the powers of 2. All right. Now, as we uh, continue on, there are some more elaborate, uh, more interesting identities. One of the uh, more well-known ones is called the hockey stick identity. There are actually two versions of this. But it looks like this. What we're going to do is imagine what happens if I were to add the numbers along a 45 degree downwards diagonal. So if I were to take 1, 5, 15, and 35 and add them all together, you'll see that I get 35 plus 15 is 50, 5 more makes 55, and 1 more makes 56. And 56 is exactly the number that lies uh, southwest of 35. Similarly, 1 plus 6 plus 21 plus 56 plus 126 is equal to 210. Now this will always be true as long as you're taking a downward diagonal, a 45 degree uh, diagonal in either direction. You have to start at the very edge of the triangle. You have to start with the one on the edge. But if you were to go for as long or as short as you'd like and add the numbers all together, their sum can be found just by taking a right angle turn, heading down to the row below that, and uh, reading off that number. So 1 plus 4 plus 10 is equal to 15. And you can try it for any row, for any length of hockey stick you like. You'll see that the sum is always there waiting for you at the end, the end of your hockey stick. Now in symbols, uh, the, uh, the red hand version of a hockey stick is written in this way. We're going to start on the rth row, but to, at the 0th diagonal. And we'll move along to the r plus 1th row, first diagonal, r plus 2 row, the second diagonal, and so on. And if we keep adding those up, we'll see that the sum can be found one row later, but in the same diagonal as the uh, diagonal you ended on. So we get r plus k plus 1, uh, choose k, where k is where we, uh, where we ended the left-hand side sum. Similarly, on the right, we're going to take, we're going to start on the rth row. This time we're going to start on the very last entry, the rth diagonal. And if we move along one row uh, down on the same diagonal, we'll have r plus 1, choose r. Then we'd have r plus 2, choose r, and so on, until we get down to r plus k, choose r. And then the sum of all of those will be found one row later, one diagonal later. So we'll have r plus k plus 1, choose r plus 1. All right? Now these identities are actually quite useful. We'll run into them again. So it's good to be familiar with them. All right, well, that concludes our discussion uh, for this first video. We've seen that Pascal's triangle has a very interesting connection to these binomial coefficients, which are actually the choose numbers we've seen before. In the next video, we'll continue talking about those three famous theorems, and uh, we'll see you there.